Good morning, all. We're here for an appeal hearing in the matter CA 10 2015 before the Chief Justice Michael Wang, Justice Richard Field, and His Excellency Justice Omar Muheri. The appellant is represented by Herbert Smith Brehills. The counsel is Tom Leach, QC, assisting is Nathan Hooper. The first respondent is represented by Brown Rudnick, LLP. Lead counsel is Roger Kennel, assisting is Ravinder Fakral. The second respondent is represented by Hogan Levels International LLP. Lead counsel is Vernon Flynn QC. Assisting is Tom Montague Smith. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, I appear for the appellate day of this appeal. Uh, I'm standing on the right hand side of the court because that's the, uh, the um, configuration that we've adopted over the course of the previous hearings. and the. Uh, um, respondents, Mr. Flynn on the far left and Mr. Kennel uh, to my immediate left, uh, prefer to stay in their same position. So if you'll forgive us, we're adopting the same positions that we were in before. Uh, Your Honour, if I could deal first of all with the timetable, we have a busy programme. We have two days uh, listed for this appeal. Um, there was a timetable agreed for the first day, which is that day R, that, that my clients would have the morning to deliver their submissions. Um, then uh, the afternoon, uh, up until 5 o'clock or 5.30, would be uh, NBC's response. Uh, and then on day two, there's some dispute about quite how we deliver the time, but the principal um, material that we would be dealing with on <coughs> day two would be the applications of my learned friend, Mr. Kennel, on the assumption, of course, that only uh, that the court allows the appeal in relation to um, the primary appeal made by JR. There's just one issue I wanted to float with the court, which is that um, my learned friend, Mr. Flynn, and Talim is the respondent to only one of Mr. Kennel's applications. That's the application on behalf of NBC. Uh, NBC applies to join uh, Talim uh, and to appeal against the order, uh, or rather applies to amend the pleadings, uh, and to appeal against the order to fix Talim with the uh, Murabaha profits in the event that the appeal succeeds. That's only one basis of his applications. He has a number of other applications, as you will have seen. Now, one thing that Mr. Flynn and I have floated uh, is the possibility that he might deal with that application first. That would mean it's a short, very short application. That would mean that Mr. Flynn uh, would, and Mr. Montague Smith who, and uh, Hogan Lovells, who represent them, would be unnecessary for the rest of the appeal. They play little part in the rest of the two days' activities. Uh, I should make it clear that if we don't have to make a decision immediately after the application, but the rest of the argument is not contingent on the outcome of that application. Well, I, I'm not sure that Mr. Flynn wishes to be here for the rest of the argument, well, well, however he decides. I think he's happy enough for the rest of the argument to proceed without him, whatever whatever you decide. So you don't have to make a decision on the application, as I understand his position. All he's saying is that you could deal with his application discreetly on the basis, on the assumption, of that his assumption only, of course, uh, that the appeal succeeds, and then you could deal with his application. I think he anticipates it won't take very long. Uh, I should also say that if I could just, uh, your lordships have a number of bundles. The, the, the bundle B contains the judgments and the orders, which is the principal bundle of documents that we'll be looking at. It may be helpful if we just go to uh, the order made by the Deputy Chief Justice, uh, Sir David Steele, which you'll find behind tab 11. Uh, and you'll see that the order uh, that the Deputy Chief Justice made is on page 307. see that he made a number of declarations uh, hereby ordered that a series of declarations on the 4th of December the claimant and the second defendant that's Talim and Dayar concluded an agreement pursuant to which the claimant's interest in the units in the property known as Sky Gardens were transferred to the second defendant claimant's <coughs> obligation to repay the first defendant that's NBC the principal monies to finance the purchase of the interest as well as the Murabaha profits and late payment charges were transferred to the second defendant 
And then you can see the consequential declarations, no liability to the first defendants for any finance. First defendants claim against the second defendant group for repayment of the principal monies, succeeds, and then there's an order for payment of the principal sum. And then it's, you can see how it's broken down over the page. And it's 3, 3A, the principal sum, which we don't challenge. So the appeal only relates to the uh, outstanding total Moraba her profit charges to date of the judgment, AED 50, nearly 51 million. Very substantial sum of money. Uh, but, uh, and then there are total late payment charges, which again are not challenged. So the only subject matter of the appeal is paragraph 3B of the audit. We don't challenge any of the declarations. We simply challenge the Mirabaha profit. And the issue, we say, which the judge really was required to decide uh, at the second hearing is a very simple one, which was namely, what was the Mirabaha profit payable under the Mirabaha agreement, which I'll take you to. Uh, and we submit that he concluded that correctly, but then went on to make a, what we will submit are impermissible findings outside the scope of the issues in the case and outside the pleadings. That's, in a summary, our case, uh, but I'll develop that in a num number of different ways. But uh, the only thing that we challenge on this appeal is that element of the order. And it's on that basis that Mr. Flynn submits, or will submit, I suspect, uh, that it's possible simply to deal with him very discreetly. Perhaps you would like to hear from him before I, and then take a decision on that particular point. Yes, Mr. Pitt. Your Honour, it's, it's a very, very short point. Um, as, as you may have seen from our skeleton, it, it only arises if the day our appeal succeeds. And we say, actually, there is no basis for the appeal whatsoever because no one is challenging the scope or existence of the innovation. So and if that isn't challenged, there is no possibility of my client being brought back in. Um, and I can make that point very short. Uh, uh, that is at the heart of it. So I think everyone has agreed that it's very short. We are here, and we've been asked to come by the other party, and everyone agrees that we should be here. And we, it would either should be dealt with at the beginning or at the end, and we would suggest, uh, certainly from our point of view, at the beginning would certainly be better, because we are not concerned with any of the rest of the argument. So with your, your own permission, we could then leave the court. Um, speak, I, I, I suspect my submission to be no more part of that. Your Honour, if I could just respond to the points. Um, NBC's um, position is that we, we, we don't think the application against Hadley should be dealt with now. Um, you can obviously understand that uh, we're then friends of KTS Way and um, are desperate to sit through uh, two days of this appeal, which they say they were concerned. But uh, in NBC's that's the place to determine the, the application against NBC. Once it's heard the underlying appeal, once it's been through the documents, once it's seen how these um, um, proceedings have been developed. And my, my learned friend has just taken you to um, one paragraph of the order, um, in the paragraph being, in fact, if I could ask you to have that um, just to hand, and then if I could ask you to take part of what A, This, this is the consent order that was agreed by uh, Salim and Deir after, after Deir had withdrawn ground one of the appeal. Um, but, and, and so they agree that um, Deir's appeal against certain paragraphs of the order is dismissed. But at paragraph two, you'll, you'll see that they are, they, they dismissed the appeal against paragraph 1B of the order, which you have that to hand as well. It's about the, um, it, it, 
it's about the transfer of the obligations from Itali to, to Deva. And, and that transfer is with respect to principal, product profits, and the payment charges. And you'll see in paragraph two of the consent order, so that's a bundle A document, that the Deva's um, appeal against paragraph 1B is, is dismissed, save to the extent that the Court of Appeal allows any appeal against the amount, if any of the Marabo profit charges, which the second event was ordered to pay in paragraph 3B of the order. So it, there is, there is, there does still seem to be um, an, an excellent appeal against the, the fact that the transfer and how much. And in MVC submission, there's a clear finding in the judgment that Italian was liable. Yes, but I thought the idea was that we wouldn't decide the application now, just hear the arguments uh, as a matter of logistics to allow Mr. Um, Flynn to leave. I don't know whether Mr. Montague Smith is going to stay on, uh, but uh, if, if, if that's the risk they want to run of not putting their hand up at the end of the second day and say, uh, now that the arguments are in, we want to add to our submissions, then that's their uh, choice, isn't it? Well, that's their choice, but it's also my choice. I, I wish that the, 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 the logical order of the application is the, the appeal is heard first. The well, question is whether logic or logistics prevail with it. <laughs> well, we, NBC describes the back as a, 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 back, yeah, a, a bit player back to the trial. Um, my learned friends have already come out here. This suggestion was only made yesterday. Uh, the timetable whereby the application was dealt with at the end of the hearing was, uh, was agreed by. What happens if we split the baby? Uh, they make their arguments and disappear. You leave your arguments till the end. <laughs> then he doesn't get a right of reply. Yeah, no, sure. I, I mean, NBC, <coughs> NBC is content for the application against, um, against Italian to be adjourned until after judgment is given. Um, and so they can still make their arguments and make their arguments. We're thinking of adopting the last suggestion made by you, uh, Mr. Kennell. Uh, so, what does Mr. Flynn say to that? In other words, we stand over this whole application till after the Court of Appeal dis delivers its judgment on Mr. Leach's appeal. Yes, uh, Your Honour. What I would say about that is.
would say about the alternative is this, that I would be concerned if anything over the course of the two days in any way affected our application. But as I understand it, both uh, Mr. Leach has confirmed that he is not attacking the scope or existence of the relation, nor um, the NBC. And in both circumstances, the point is actually a very short one. It's very short indeed, because if no one is attacking it, it can, and on the assumption that no one can change their position over the two days, there is no logical basis upon which any liability can come back to my client. So it's, it's, it is a remarkably short point. From your point of view, well, yes, I'm sure you know. The right. panel will have something else to he, say. Yes, he may, but at the moment, nothing's been articulated. Um, if something were to be articulated that would affect that position, I can see. I can see that, that, that then it, it might be able to take that course. But as we're here, and at the moment, there's no articulated basis for attacking in any way, either the existence or the scope of the litigation, it, it, it's, it, 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 is a, it is a very short point indeed. Yeah, but again, the the structure of the uh, timetable is such that it's listed for after Mr. Leach's appeal. Mr. Kennell says that he may want to craft his response to your application, taking into account the events and the arguments of these two days. So we're back to the other suggestion. I mean, if you want to go off now and come back at the end, um, that's one thing we can look up. In other words, you, know, you take today and you know, most of tomorrow off and then come in when you're really needed, maybe even uh, Tuesday morning. Uh, I, I, the very uh, difficulty, I, I'm perfectly happy to say that. Uh, if, your Lordship, if your Honours would like me to do that, I'm very, mm. I mean, it's, it's not, it's, that is not the issue. What, what I'm troubled by is the idea that anything will happen over the next few days that will affect this fundamental position. No one is saying and That's why you should be here. <laughs> yes, mm. uh, to make sure that they don't go out, outside the boundaries of what they've said they're not, they're not going to do. I, I, I see that. You can put a marker at the appropriate time if you think that that's happening. So you can justify your presence in the court. <laughs> yeah. All, right. All right, so shall we do it that way? Um, we will revisit the issue at the end, or, or maybe somewhere at a convenient time when it becomes apparent that we might take uh, Mr. Kennell's last suggestion of standing over the whole application. Actually, you know, literally you have to sit to the very end Yes. Um, and then, if whatever you've heard doesn't <coughs> bother you, yes. um, then we will stand this over uh, till well, after we deliver well our Well, the session. attraction of the standing over is this, is that it, it, if, you're, if you're, if I understand the position, what your honours are contemplating is standing over until you've dealt with the main appeal. Given judgment. And, and then, and then and that, in that basis, there would be no point to stay here at all. It would be, it may never happen. And if it were to happen, you could then address it in the light of the findings of that's entirely your choice, because you have a right to stay, and you were slated to be here and to stay through the two days. So it, it's really a strategic decision for you and your team. Um, can we proceed in the meantime yeah. with Mr. Leach's yes, argument, yeah. and then you can consider your position yeah, with your and client? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Leach. <coughs> I'm grateful, Your Honour. I hope that hasn't turned. If, if we come back to the timetable, I anticipate that I will should be completed my submissions on the appeal uh, well before lunchtime. I hope I'm not at o'clock. I mean that I should be well before lunchtime. Uh, then there will be NBC's reply submissions. As I understand it, uh, Mr. Flynn is not very interested in making any reply submissions. And then I would hope that we could deal with my learned friend's applications in relatively short order tomorrow. We will have travelled over quite a lot of the ground which relate to his. Um, uh, applications when we when I deal with my main submissions. Uh, we were in bundle B. Looking at the order. Uh, I'm going to come back and look in a little detail at the first judgment, but really by way of background to explain how we got to the second judgment. But I would just want to focus on the finding against which we appeal. So if we could go forward, you'll see that the, you've now seen the order, and you'll see that the judge ordered the total Marabba had profit charges. What he, what he, page 307, what he declared was that the claimant's obligation to repay the first defendant the principal monies advanced to finance the purchase of the interest. 
as well as Miranda had profit and late payment charges were transferred to the second defendant. Um, he made no declaration that there was any sort of agreement between DR and NBC. But when it came, and, and that was after the, um, the uh, second judgment and was handed down as part of the second judgment. But when we look at his actual findings, what you'll see is that the second, grief, uh, second hearing, which was a, an ancillary hearing, dealt with a number of points. But the critical point, you, you'll see that he dealt, what if we go forward on page 309, and I'll come back to um, the introductory paragraphs when I go through the chronology. He dealt with some arguments that we raised about novation in relation to the first judgment. Uh, and you can see that the critical finding that he made in paragraph 98 of the first judgment. In summary, therefore, the position at the top of page 311. Summary, therefore, the position is in my judgment that as stated by Mr. Rosanna as a concluded agreement for the transfer of Tullian's interest in Sky Gardens to Day on the 4th of December 2008. Uh, and the criticism that we had made uh, to the Court of Appeal, and then which was the subject of argument at the start of the second hearing in November uh, 2014, uh, was that he'd not dealt with the position as between NBC and JR. And then he said, taken in isolation, it could be said that it does not express, reading from paragraph 9, taken in isolation, it could be said it doesn't expressly relate to the position as between JR and NBC. But inferentially, it's only consistent with JR being liable to repay NBC, since otherwise there would have been no commercial value to, to leave, including the transfer of Sky Gardens to JR. And then he dealt with uh, Talim's uh, pleaded case. He then dealt with the judgment. And then his conclusions on the novation points that I raised, and on which uh, His Honour the Chief Justice uh, initially gave permission to appeal, was in paragraph 30. It says, in the result issue 5 adds little to issue 1, save that confirming the ability of NBC to sue they are. In the event, no fair reading of the judgment as a whole can give rise to any other conclusion <coughs> than that they are, NBC and Talim reached agreement for the transfer of all Talim's rights and obligations in respect of Sky Gardens, including the obligation to re repay NBC. And that was achieved by a novation of the existing finance structure. And this paragraph, paragraph 13, Your Honour on page 313. Uh, and you'll see again, that was achieved by a novation of the existing finance structure. Such was the clearest mutual intention of the parties. If there be any residual doubt, I say fine. So there was a novation of the existing finance structure. That was the finding. But then he says additional issues. Leaving aside this request for clarification in the light of Justice Jar's observations, they are now seeks to raise a number of additional points. And you can see that the kind of points that we were advancing. He said, solely for the purpose of argument, let me assume that some or all of the points could have furnished a defense to liability. And even if there be no issue of stop or switch and so called, to raise them at this stage is, in my judgment, a paradigm example of an abusive process important to have in mind that there was a very limited exclusion of issues for determination of the trial. Paragraph 14 of the case management order made by the Deputy Chief Justice on the 20th of February 2013 provided as follows, and you can see paragraph 14 there, and I'll come back to it when I come to the list of issues. It says, in fact, no issue in regard to damages necessitating expert evidence would arise in the context of the transfer. During the course of the trial, there was some discussion as to the financial outcome. The court was invited to give judgment on the issues as argued, since the various presentations made it difficult to provide coherent help. That was the background to the closing paragraph of the judgment, which has already been quoted. The present hearing was intended to deal with these outstanding matters. It was not a vehicle for raising unpleaded and unargued issues of liability. Talim and NBC have established that all these defences should have been raised in the trial. See Johnson and Goodwood, Goldwood, and then R and V Vesicarum against risk insurance, and that's an authority I'm going to take you to briefly a little later. This is, renders it unnecessary to consider the merits of the new challenge to the validity of the transfer. If 
By the same token, it's not necessary to consider the questions raised as the effect of any assignment or the availability of remedy of specific performances. I should add that Dayar sought to advance an argument during the hearing within the context of specific performance that the Murabaha agreement was invalid as a matter of Sharia law. This had been expressly disclaimed at the trial. And I'm going to come back to precisely what the concession was. Suffice it, I remain wholly persuaded that if any of the points referred to above had been taken earlier, they would have been sound. So you can see that there was a, a very limited finding, there was a very limited uh, scope for the that was disposal here. It was dispo intended to deal only with those issues in, in paragraph 14. And it was also intended not to deal with unpleaded and unargued issues of <coughs> liability. So the se second hearing would be concerned to spell out what the package was that had been transferred. Exactly. That, that is, in a nutshell, my argument, my lord. And that it is now too, it was too late at the second hearing, indeed, after the second hearing, to start raising new issues which involved new liabilities and, in fact, a new contract. And it is a matter of substance for the reason, it's not simply a pleading point, as my learned friends have articulated it. It is actually a matter of, it's a matter of two things, but it's a matter of substance for the reasons I'm going to take you to. And it's also a matter of simply common fairness, which is that we raised a number of issues, uh, one of which found favour with Your Honour, the Chief Justice, at the um, leave stage. At leave stage. Uh, but nevertheless, the parties were treated differently. And, and that was the basis on which uh, Your Honour, the Chief Justice, gave permission to appear. So there is a, a, a strand. It's no more than a strand, because obviously if there's nothing in it, it wouldn't necessarily be unfair, but there is a strand of just simply common unfairness we submit in the way that we were dealt with in the second period. <coughs> and then, in, in moving on, in quantum, NBC put forward a series of figures for the second uh, hearing. Uh, all these figures were challenged as by JR as set out below. Uh, and there was an argument about whether the second payment of 81 million uh, should be excluded. And, and, and this is the reason I say that there's no challenge to anything other than paragraph B of the order, because we set, accept that that liability was, tra was transferred. That's the effect of the withdrawal of ground one. And the total profit under the terms of the Murabaha agreement was AED 1,492,699. That's the, that's the actual figure provided in the Murabaha agreement. And then the total late payment charge amounted to 2% of the principal sum, which on Dayar's case amounted to AED 2 million. And again, that's a contractual figure. In the result, Dayar's case was that on the net amount payable was the figure you can see. And then during the course of the hearing, there was one area in which the issue is na narrowed. Charge for late payment arose from Article 4, and you can see, and I'll come back to the Murabaha agreement, so I don't ask you to, to focus yet on the specific provisions of it, uh, 22 and 23. And it says, as agreed to regard the amount payable, it was at least common ground that Dayar made a payment of 50 million on the 9th of April. But it, as noted above, it was Dayar's case that this constituted a payment of principal only, while Salim intended that it constituted a part payment of principal, balance being profit accrued due. The, this dispute, in effect, turned on the legitimacy or, or otherwise of NBC's profit claim. So it's two payments, the a AED 81 million, uh, which is no longer an issue, and then 26. But that leaves the claim of profit charges. This is advanced at 5.5% per annum of the amount outstanding at any one time. At the hearing, and this is an important paragraph which I, I invite your, Lord, your Honour and your Lordship to continue. At the hearing, I understood it to be said on behalf of NBC that this rate was to be derived from the lump sum profit figure being the foundation of profit accrued to the 31st of August 2008 <coughs> and included within the sale price as specified in Article 3 of the Murabaha Agreement. Even though the agreement itself did not specify a profit for 5.5% per annum as such. In this regard, NBC further relied at the hearing upon an email dated 4th June 2009 uh, from Mr. Krishna Murphy of Day R to NBC, which appeared to confirm the correctness of calculations based on 5.5% as cons constituting profit accruals thereafter. It was of some note that no further explanation of the obligation to pay profit at that or indeed any rate was forthcoming during the hearing. 
Now, our position at the second hearing was that this is a question of, it's simply a question of what does the agreement say? What are we, were we obliged to pay, assuming that the agreement had been transferred to us? We challenged the transfer, the scope of the novation, but that having gone, our point on was what does the agreement say? And in contrast, it was Dayar's position that the total profit was the specific lump sum profit figure to be recoverable under the Murabaha agreement and as such included in the purchase price. No Sorry, Mr. Leach, to interrupt you, just to clarify your position. Um, do you accept that as between uh, MBC uh, and Talim, uh, the arrangements did provide for payment of a late charge of uh, 2% per annum after August 2008? No, no, Your Honour. All, all I, the, the question is what were the liabilities that were transferred? What I do accept is that the liabilities of Talim and JR were the same. So the critical question is what were the obligations that were transferred? Sorry, I, I misspoke. It, it was a 5.5% continuing interest figure. But do you accept that that was an obligation that was agreed between MBC and Talim? No, I don't, Your Honour. It was never agreed, in fact. That five, it was never, more importantly, it was never agreed between NBC and Talim because one of the features of the evidence, which we'll look at very briefly, is that NBC, uh, Talim, I beg your pardon, refused to enter into any further financing agreements once the, it became apparent that the obligations were to be transferred to, um, to NBC. So the, 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 the issue between, there's no issue between Talim and us. The, the issue that we're now fighting, having lost on who is liable, is how much was there to pay. That's the, the issue that we are arguing. And in a sense, if, if we're right about that, then there can be no claim against Talim as Mr. Flynn says. So the critical question is, what was the obligation that was transferred on the 4th of December? And, and as my Lord, Lord, uh, my Lord Justice Field stated, you know, the, the purpose of the second was to establish that, or well, that's what we said. And then he, he went on. It, it's clear that this topic had not received adequate analysis in the skeletons of the quantum hearing and required further elaboration. In the result, with my lead, there was a further exchange of fairly lengthy written submissions. But these I've read and am now in position to rule on the issue. The feature of the much of the debate in the new submissions was a written agreement in the form of a promised purchase to which the draft. Murabaho agreement was attached to Schedule 2. This agreement was scarcely mentioned at the trial. All the subsequent hearing was not brought to my attention in the context of the profit there. He then sets out. And then he says, 31, and this is again an important paragraph. It was common ground that this percentage indeed provided the basis of the profit figure in the Murabaho agreement, which was signed on the 21st of October, albeit only covering payments made by NBC up until the end of August. It is, if it is not common ground, I say fine. So the, what he found was that the, there was an obligation to pay a fixed sum, uh, and I'll show you that figure. What remained at issue was whether profit at that rate was due on sums outstanding or advanced <coughs> thereafter, or whether the profit figure, albeit calculated for a specific period, was all that was due. So that's the issue. He then deals with the Mirabra in their agreement. And then in 33, he says, against that background, it's necessary to deal with one threshold point raised by the to the effect that since both the promise to pay and the Murabaha agreement were subject to by law to the extent that these laws are not inconsistent with the principles of Sharia, in which case the principles of Sharia will prevail, any obligation to pay interest in the form of an <coughs> unpredetermined amount increasing in time would be invalid. Put another way, since the concept of interest was a conflict with Sharia principles, Clause 2.2 could only be read as imposing an obligation to pay the nominated sum as profit and no more. Now, there is a, uh, a, a misconception in paragraph 33, which we'll have to come to, which is that the choice of law clauses in the promise to, per promise to purchase and the Muradahar agreement were different. It's quite clear that the promise to purchase was subject to uh, the, the laws of the UAE and the federal. That's what it says. For some curious reason, the two documents contain different choice of law clauses. Not my documents, so I don't understand why that was, but that is the position. So it wasn't simply a question of one saying 
There was actually a different choice of law clause. I'll come to show you that in a moment, see, see what it says, which, which is actually some significance <coughs> since reliance is now being placed on the, or then being placed on the promise of purchase. Uh, and then moving on. So uh, we say that the, in effect, the arrangement was governed by the Sharia standards that we'll, we'll come to. And, and that's relevant for a number of reasons, which I'll also explain as I go in my, in my submission. Uh, and they're not reasons which involve any application of Sharia law directly. And again, I'll explain my reasons for that in a moment or two. But just going on in the judgment, he says, as already noted, they are disclaimed in the liability any reliance on failure to comply with Sharia law, which in any event is not completed. This might not include arguments based on Sharia law in regard to the invalidity of provisions for accruing profit. But absent any plea in that respect, I don't regard it as open to they are to pursue such an argument. In any event, I wouldn't regard the submission as having any merit. And moreover, our agreement is subject to DIFC law. Sharia law is not a national system of law. The reference to it is no more than a reflection of the principles upon which NBC acts. Furthermore, it cannot trump the law of the jurisdiction. And I'll take you to Shamil Bank. As I understand AR's case, no profit accrued to you after the 31st of August 2008. One outstanding principle, and no profit ever accrued on the AED 81 million payments in September 2008. To put it no strongly, this is a surprisingly uncommercial arrangement. And that's obviously a paragraph upon which the Defendant, uh, respondent, NBC plays a great deal of reliance. But it's only an uncommercial arrangement if one accepts that the Sharia standards don't apply. And these were two Sharia compliant organisations who were negotiating on the basis that they would enter into a series of Murabaha agreements. And that was the only way to document a contract of this kind. Furthermore, focusing solely on the period up until the end of August, the profit figure was not based on some fraction of the sun outstanding. It was based on a time rate of 5.5% per annum. That is true. But then moving over the page, despite those concerns, he says, that said, it is correct that the Murabaha agreement was not replaced for the period post 31st August 2008. So what you have is a finding that the Murabaha agreement only covered the fixed sum of 1.492 million, only covering payments up to the end of August. And you have also a second finding in 36, or a, uh, an amplification of that finding in the first sentence of 36, correct that the Murabaha agreement was not replaced for the period post 31st August 2008. So the judge agreed with us about the construction of the Murabaha agreement and what was payable under it. And that is an important feature of this case, because we don't say that he was doing anything that was inconsistent with the Sharia standards when he was actually deciding what the Murabaha agreement meant and what the obligation under it required. We have no quarrel with 31 and 36, and that in, in, in those two paragraphs he effectively accepted our argument. It's what comes next which is the subject of our appeal. It says, as I understand the case of NBC, it's contended that the conduct of the parties establishes that there were agreements between DAR and NBC post 30th of August, which contained an agreement for continuation of an accrual of profit of 5.5%. So where are you reading from now? Uh, the second sentence of paragraph 36 at the top of page 320. Yes, okay. Agreements between today are an MBC, albeit unsigned, which contained an agreement for continuation of an accrual of profit of 5.5%. In order to make good that point, NBC has embarked on a somewhat exhausting analysis of the contemporary documentation, a task which I will also have to embark on, although hopefully it's somewhat, somewhat less length. Then sets out the legal principles, uh, which I'll come back to. <coughs> when I deal with my arguments on the appeal. But if I could then move on to page 322. He frames the question, and this is a very important question that arises, is whether given the absence of an executed Murabaha agreement for the period post August 2008, there was in fact 
contract on the same terms as previously between NBC and JR, and in particular whether it included a provision for profit payments on the amount outstanding included in the September instalment. So that's the issue that he identifies as between the parties. Now in our submission, that was not an issue which should have been considered at the second hearing. It's an issue which should have been considered at the first hearing. One sees this very clearly when we get to issue... When we look Why at doesn't that go to what the package was? This question. Because he's asked, he, what, what he's asking is whether there were in fact, there was a direct agreement between NBC and JR rather than uh, between NBC and Tulane. One remembers that the finding is that there's a transfer of obligations at 4th of December 2008. This is not about the package that Talim entered into, which was then assigned, novated to JR. This is about a separate series of agreements between NBC and JR. And one gets that from, we looked at it at 36. 36 and 38, one looks at The case being advanced is that there were agreements be it between JR and NBC first 30th of August, which contained an agreement for continuation of an accrual profit. And then 38, and then one looks at 40, you look at the events that he goes through, travels over the ground between, this is a, in a sense, a rerun of a lot of the uh, documents which were before the court of the first trial, up until the 30th of April. And then one goes to 41, In short, I accept NBC's case that the parties agreed a profit of 5.5% and consistently applied it. Lump sum payments in any individual wherever her agreement merely reflected the profit due at the date as at the anticipated date of repayment. The absence of executed wherever her agreements post August 2008 is no bar to claim for profit. The parties' communications and course of conduct demonstrates that. So he's not concerned with the first wherever her agreement or the, or the agreement that was transferred post uh, 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 was transferred, I beg your pardon, on the 4th of December 2008. He's concerned with a, a new series of agreements, which were never the subject of findings at the, the first trial. And one, if one goes back to tab 7, and I'll take it when we get to it, one can see the list of issues In tab 7, B7, and if one turns to issues 5 and 6, Five is so that issue one, did JR and Telium enter into a legally binding agreement under which JR assumed or agreed to acquire Telium's rights and obligations in respect of Sky Gardens, including Telium's obligations to repay NBC in respect of the financing that had provided Telium to purchase the interest in Sky Gardens. And then five and six, the answer to issue one is yes, was there one an ovation? or to an assignment to JR of Tulum's obligations to repay NBC. And in either case, did that enable NBC to sue JR? And then six, if the answer to issue one and five A is that JR did not acquire Tulum's obligations to repay NBC pursuant to a novation assignment, did JR and NBC otherwise reach any binding legal agreement in relation to Sky Gardens or its financing? And if so, what agreement? So the question whether there were separate obligations assumed between NBC and JR was an issue for determination of the first trial. No plea case of the first trial wasn't argued at the first trial and the judge made no findings to that effect at the first trial. So this was something that was raised after the event, even after the second hearing. And, in, and then a finding which in our submission ran contrary 
to the judge's conclusion in paragraph 70. We're back in the second judgment now. Back in the set, so on page 314. The present hearing was intended to deal with these outstanding matters. It's not a vehicle for raising unpleaded and unargued issues of liability. And it's our submission that this was an unpleaded and unargued issue of liability. Uh, is it your case that in the pleadings and arguments at the first hearing that there was no indication that MDC uh, was claiming for um, finance charges after the end of August 2008. No, it's not my case. In fact, I'm going to take you to the, the pleadings immediately. Um, so, if your client was already put on notice that there was a claim for that amount, uh, were they taken by surprise? They were taken by surprise by the argument that there were set new agreements between NBC and um, Day R. The finding in the, all of the evidence in the first trial was directed to the question whether there had been a transfer of obligations, liabilities and obligations on the 4th of December. One sees that in the first, one sees that in the, if one goes to the first judgment, goes to page 286. Tab 8 of bundle B. The threshold issue is whether negotiations between Talim and Dayar for the acquisition by Dayar of Talim's rights and obligations in respect of Sky Gardens led to a legally binding agreement under which Dayar assumed or agreed to acquire such rights and obligations, including Talim's obligations to repay NBC in respect of the financing it had provided to Talim to purchase its interest in Sky Gardens. It's common ground that this issue can be determined by reference to DIFC level since it's not suggested by any part of the application of UAE law would give rise to a different result. And then if one goes forward to page 288, paragraph 78, the scope of this threshold issue narrowed significantly during the course of the hearing. Talene had opened their case on the basis that a contract was concluded at some stage between December 2008 and May 2009. As finally presented, Talene's case was that a contract constituting an unconditional transfer of its rights and obligations in regard to its share of Sky Gardens came into existence when they are paid a premium, and such being a non-refundable proportion of the agreed consideration. So that is the issue <coughs> as it was finally that critical issue that the judge decided, and one can see what he decided on page 290 in paragraph 290, of the pa page 290, paragraph 98. In summary, therefore, the position is in my judgment that as stated by Mr. Azam, there was a concluded agreement for the transfer of Talim's interest as amended, as an, a, an amendment to the tripartite agreement to that effect has been prepared. And that is the finding. You don't need to be troubled by Dayar's alternative case, which was about setting this aside the transaction. So that's the conclusion, and that was the issue to which all the evidence was directed. No finding of any, or, or, 
of any contract between JR and NBC, and no finding of the assumption of any obligations after the 4th of December 2008. And in fact, when we come to look at the evidence, it is very unequivocal. It is equivocal in my submission. Can I ask you, is it your case, or do you accept the argument that, uh, to use <coughs> Justice Beale's uh, terminology, um, your clients took the package, and the package was whatever had been agreed between uh, Talim and NBC with regard to financing. So the package includes the post-August 2008 payments due, if indeed they were agreed between Talim and NBC. If they've been agreed between Talim and NBC, then we would accept that. But that was not the case that was being advanced, and, and nor could it be advanced. No, but that's important because then you are focusing on the inquiry as to what actually was agreed between them. So that's the direction of your attack. Yes, and what agreed, what they had been agreed was in the Murabaha agreement. And I'll, I'll show you that as we go through the, the argument. So your Honour is quite right to... to, to just narrow Arsenal. the scope of the... Uh, yeah, so the, the question is, what was agreed between Talim and NBC before the 4th of December 2009? And when we look at what was agreed between Talim and, on, and NBC on the 4th of December 2009, nothing beyond the actual Murabaha agreement had been agreed, because, and I'll take you to the relevant passage in Mr. Subi's witness statement, NBC, Talim just refused to sign any further Murabaha agreements after that period. It, it, it may, so that, that, that is, in, in a sense, my, my Lord Justice Field identifies a key question, which is what was the package that was agreed between NBC and JR? NBC and Talib. That was the issue for determination of the second hearing. Now, you may come to the conclusion, having seen the evidence or seen the way it's put, uh, that there's no difference. That in effect, all the judge was finding what was, what, what was uh, implicit in the package between NBC and Talib. But that's not the way he put it in the judgment. He found there was a separate series of agreements. Uh, and secondly, uh, we would say that there is some difficulty in, in finding that, given that the issue had been raised squarely at the, at the trial, there for determination, uh, and NBC had not asked the judge to make a finding in relation to that, or identify that, or even plead in a separate case, particularly in reliance on the promise to purchase, and, and this is important. So uh, we really make four submissions in relation to the, the conclusion that there was a series of separate agreements or a separate agreement between um, NBC and JR to pay the Rabahat problem. Uh, first, it was a claim that wasn't pleaded and advanced at trial. Secondly, it was an issue that could and should have been dealt with at trial. When you say the trial, you mean the first hearing? First, first hearing, which was the trial. In fact, there was no hearing of evidence. So I'll, I'll refer to that as the trial, if I may. Yes. Uh, and that's the point about, we said, if, if you agree that an issue is to be determined at the first hearing, you can't then later reopen the issue at the second hearing. That's what the judge decided, and we submit there's clear authority on that, quite apart from the separate question of pleading. Uh, thirdly, we submit that the evidence at trial on the issue of agreement between JR and NBC was equivocal at best and more favourably, and, and if considered favourably to us, didn't justify such a fight. And I'm going to take you to that evidence. And the fourth we, we say that the agreement was inconsistent with the terms of the Murabaha agreement 
and the Sharia principles upon which all three parties act. That's Tully, NBC, and they are. And, and in answer, make one further observation in answer to uh, Your Honour, Your Honour's question, which is, of course, that the the argument suggestion that the, it was all part of the package, that the obligation to pay 5.5% interest was all part of the original package, is now the subject matter of the proposed amendments made in the respondents' notice. If one looks at uh, NBC's proposed amendments, which you'll find in bundle A, find that on page 135, behind tab 18, so on into a different volume. bundle A, which is the um, the principal appeal documents, Your Honour. B is the judgments and orders, and bundle A is the principal appeal documents. You'll find that this is what NBC now seeks permission, the case it now seeks to advance. So if the appeal succeeds, this is the case that it now... And, and this is, in fact, the first time we've actually seen a pleaded case on the Murabha Abbey property. How it arose. So if you can, you can go to paragraph 6. Talim and NBC, which was partly recorded in writing by way of a Murabaha agreement, and the promise to purchase. NBC agreed to finance Talim's purchase of an interest in Sky Gardens, pursuant to a tripartite agreement dated 7th of July. And then you see paragraph 7. The Murabaha agreement, which was a schedule to the promise to purchase, only amounted to a partial record of the agreement as it concerned payments made by NBC and due from Tallinn towards the purchase of the interest until the 31st of August 2008. So that accepts that we're right and that the judge was right about the, uh, the scope of the original Murabaha agreement. And then paragraph 8, the agreement to finance extended beyond installments due by the 31st of August and required Tallinn to pay 5.5% per annum on any additional installments paid by NBC until repayment. Rabaha profit until 31st of August amounted to AUD 1492698862. And then it goes on, the agreement to finance was further evidenced by the following correspondence and conduct of the parties between September 2008 and November 2009, set out, set out below, of paragraphs 10 to 86. The agreement to which establish a, what, and then there is a series of propositions, which are similar in some ways to what was advanced before in the supplemental submissions made to the judge after the conclusion of the second period. So that is the case which Talim, sorry, NBC now wishes to advance. This is what it says the package was, but it now says that this was the package in its application to permission, for permission to appear. What is the date of this document? Date. The amended particulars to contemplate. Isn't this an attachment for permission to it is. submit this? Because there is no sign off date at the end of that. Date. The date is, my lord, if you are, if you give me, it's the same date. Served with the respondent's notice, which was 2nd of December last year. So that is attached to the respondent's notice. Attached to the respondent's notice. So the case that it should have been making 
is now made in a document which is 20 pages long, sorry, which is 25 pages long, first introduced in the respondent's notice to after permission to appear in the But what is interesting about that, Your Honour, is that that's not the case as it was as found by the judge. The judge found that there was a separate agreement between NBC and DAR. So even now it's not entirely clear what case is being made. It said, oh yes, we must be entitled to the Morabaha properties. The submissions made after the first hearing to the judge were that, the, was that this was a matter of agreement between NBC and DAR. And now it's been said, oh no, it was actually agreed all along between NBC and Tali. And there are difficulties with this as a matter of when we come to look at the contract book. And, and in but my submission... Is just alternative cases? Uh, I mean, maybe I'm speaking out of turn, but uh, I have the impression that um, NBC uh, were saying uh, that there was an overall agreement between NBC and Tallinn uh, about financing up to 31st of August as well as post 31st of August 2008. That whole package got novated or assigned to your clients. Um, but if they're wrong on the novation then, uh, it seems to me just looking at this in the abstract, uh, in isolation rather, that they're now saying, well, if we are wrong uh, that it was part of the novation package, then it was an unnovated obligation of Tallinn that remains uh, Tallinn's obligation. In other words, there was an obligation by somebody, uh, and the only question is whether or not that ultimate liability for that obligation rested with Tallinn or got transferred over to your client. Well, that's not the case as it was put to, to, to the judge. The judge accepted that the... Um, no, I, I think, uh, is it quite clear? It was never put to the judge that there was this alternative case. NBC never had an alternative case against Tallinn, did it? I don't think so, no. I mean, it, yeah. I, mean I had understood... Yeah, I mean, so because it only comes about in this round, yes, you know, to that extent you must be right, then. If that's so, it didn't get distinguished that way. Well, I had understood it to be saying, well, I mean, the difficulty with that is if they're inconsistent cases. But alternative cases are always inconsistent, at least as to fact. Well, the difficulty about that is that they, uh, I, I would accept that, that these, these inconsistent cases as to facts are now being examined on an appeal yeah. when they should all have been gone into at the trial, we say, the trial on liability. But perhaps I can begin, uh, just remind you again of the, the four points that I wish to make on the appeal. Can we put this away for the time being? Yes, certainly, Your Honour. So, so, the first point we make is that the claim is uh, that there was, was not a pleaded claim and not advanced at the trial. Secondly, it was an issue that the trial had been up at the first hearing. Secondly, it was an issue which could and should have been dealt with at the first trial. Thirdly, the evidence at the trial is equivocal at best, and we say at worst, did not support the finding made by the judge. The pet matter had been pleaded out and properly advanced. And fourthly, we say it's inconsistent with the terms of the Miraba Agreement and the Sharia principles upon by which all three parties act. Those are our four submissions. And on this fourth point, as we say, we don't submit that this involves uh, the court directly applying Sharia law. Involves no, no more than the application of DIFC law, we say, and I'll develop that submission further. <coughs> if it does become necessary to do so, uh, I will ask the court to, I will challenge the judge's conclusion that the court should not give effect to the Sharia standards, but that, in my, in my understanding, only arises uh, on the application for permission to appear. So, first of all, can I take you through very briefly to some background? Just before you do, to give yes, you advice, just ask you this. Are you running two submissions in parallel? One submission 
being there was procedural unfairness, even if the judge on the material before him was entitled to reach the conclusion he did, the whole thing was unfair. Yes. And at the same time, are you saying, he wasn't entitled to reach the conclusions he did on the material before him? Yes, I am. The difficulty about the second submission is that the issue was never squarely addressed at the evidence of the But did you get permission to appeal in respect of the second? No, I did not. You got permission to appeal on procedural unfairness, as I understand it. Yes, but the, I want to show you the evidence of the, because the difficulty with the evidence of trial is that the, when it was put to the witnesses, this issue was simply never addressed. And it should have been in my submission. And the difficulty is that one can't simply take the documents in isolation without looking at the, the cross-examination of the witness. Because this is, and then say, well, I'll just rely on the documents. So it's really an element of procedural unfairness. I mean, when one looks at the, the, the cross-examination, and there are only four or five passages I want to take you to, the difficulty is that the, the evidence, the, the answers, could well support my case. And if the issue had been properly raised at the trial, it could have been put squarely by Mr. Knowles, who represented. And I, I'm not asking you to find that the evidence is inconsistent with the finding of the judge, but that it might well have been, if the issue had been able to be put squarely to the witness in cross-examination. I think it is important, because I'm accused by my, both my learned friends of, of taking no more than a pleading point. And it goes further than that in my submission in two regards. One is in relation to Sharia law, which would have become a significant issue if there had been any discussion about the, this profit figure at the first trial. And secondly, when one looks at the evidence, it's not possible to say conclusively that the witness is clearly accepted, or, or that there was overwhelming evidence which supported the conclusions of the judge. And you will have noticed, I'm sure, my Lord, Your Honour, remnants, that the, there's no reference in any way to, in the judge's judgment to any of the witness evidence at all. Some of it is actually inconsistent with what is said. But having received the written submissions for the second hearing, which would have referred to all the documents, you were in a position to make many of the points you're now making to the, to the judge, were you not? And we did, my Lord. You, you, did you submit that, that this was essentially unfair, because there hadn't been cross-examination of witnesses in the month? What we said is, I'll show you what we said, my Lord, which you'll find in bundle C3. If I take you to page 28, tab 28. C3, Your Honour. You can see what we said in Wave 2.1, and NBC, paragraph 1208, there's an introductory section. NBC now appears to advance a case that Clause 2.2 of the promise to pay imposes an independent obligation to pay interest at 5.25% per annum. Which paragraph? 
2.1, page 1208. <coughs> uh, NBC did not plead the promise of purchase or all its contractual terms of defence or its replies, and it would need permission to amend before such a case could be advanced. Could and should have applied for permission to amend at the trial. No application to amend was made, and they are objects to NBC advancing this new case after trial and after the hearing. And there's a <coughs> cavil about what was said in their document. In any event, NBC's reliance on clue clause 2.2 is misplaced, and that would deal with construction of the document, we then deal with the sale price uh, and the Sharia fund. <coughs> and we say, furthermore, 2.5, it would be impossible for the court to resolve this issue now without expert evidence. For reasons best known to themselves, NBC and Talib agreed that the promise to purchase would have a different choice of law from the Murabra Power Agreement itself, Clause 7, which we put in a footnote and I'll take you to provided that the promise to purchase should be governed by the laws of the Emirates of Dubai and the applicable federal laws of the UAE. If NBC had taken this point, it would have been necessary for the court to determine whether the payment of interest was permissible at all, both under the Sharia standards and as a matter of UAE law. It's now far too late to raise these questions. Finally, when we rely on a paragraph in the defence, and then we say section 2 of NBC's submissions is headed the Murabaha Agreements and the Promise to Purchase. It's a misleading heading. There was, of course, a single Murabaha agreement entered into between NBC and Talib, and no Murabara agreement entered into between NBC and JR. Moreover, the court is concerned only with the obligations to, of Talib to NBC, which on NBC's case were assumed by JR on the 4th of December 2008. NBC did not advance a case that they are assumed obligations directly to NBC, and no such case is pleaded. Again, it's too late for NBC to amend to assert that they are assumed direct obligation to NBC to pay interest after the 4th of December 2008. And then we take the point that the majority of the documents that which NBC had put before the court were therefore created after the execution of the pleaded contract. We then go on to deal with the documentary evidence you'll see over in 3.5. Uh, can I just have, uh, can we have a look at the whole, just tell us where the promise to pay I'm, I'm going to take you to it in, ah, in a right. moment or two. Okay. And then I'm just trying to deal with my Lord uh, Justice Field's points about whether we took these points below, and we did. And, and then in Clause 3.5, we deal with the, you, you can see, we deal with in great detail with all, all the documents that are put in. And then in 3.5.7, NBC now asserts that on the 25th of March 2009, there was an oral agreement between they are an NBC whereby JR agreed to repay the principal and Murabaha profit by the end of 2009. <coughs> NBC also asserts that the fact that the agreement was binding, despite the fact that Murabaha agreements were never executed. These assertions are not supported by the documents, but in any event, the court could not determine whether there was a binding or agreement without hearing further evidence. And 3.6, finally, NBC would need permission to amend to rely on an oral agreement made on the 25th of March 2009 before such a case could be advanced could and should have applied for permission to amend before trial, and the issue could have been determined on the evidence. No application to amend was made, and DR objects to NBC advancing this new case, not only in trial, but also after judgment. So we did take all those points, by the way, before we took the point that there was no pleaded case in relation to direct obligations, took the point on the documents, and we took the point on the evidence. So implicitly, the judge decided that these these points were not persuasive, and went on to make the findings that he did in the in his second judgment. Those, those findings, regarded as a freestanding set of findings, not being under challenge in your appeal, the uh, the question being whether there was procedural unfairness giving the way things went. Well, he, he never he, he never addressed any of those issues, in, so he never decided what is our effectively core criticism, which is that it wasn't safe to make a, make those findings in the light of the absence of pleading. But if he read your submissions, he must have decided, albeit implicitly, that he was not persuaded, and that it was open to him to make the findings he did. Well, our challenge is that it wasn't open. It is a procedurally unfair to go on and make those findings 
And we, we say that, that simply as a matter of law, one shouldn't do that in the case of this kind, which is effectively to be making new findings after trial, after the second hearing, substantial findings effectively of fact, when those matters should have been dealt with before, and especially in circumstances where he'd taken the contrary view in relation to other points which we've raised. So there's a, it, it's just two limits to the procedural unfairness, but we do suggest that it is unsafe to it was effectively unsafe for him to conclude that. Because the point of that, the fairness point is that these things should properly have been ventilated in the trial. And if one looks at the authority, it's the risk of unfairness, which is the critical thing. The risk that things should have been different. I don't need to persuade you that if the evidence had come out differently at trial, or if the witnesses had been cross-examined, they would have come to a different, the judge might have come to a different conclusion. But it's sufficient that there's a risk. And the procedural unfairness in, in dealing with it when it hasn't been raised, hasn't been pleaded, hasn't been addressed at trial. That's my submission. But it goes further than simply saying, oh, when you didn't plead it, therefore you can't have it, is really the point that I make. It is a substantive unfairness in the way that the, the procedure was built. Before we leave bundle B, perhaps we can put away bundle C. And if I could just go back to bundle B. Just to pick up a few points of background before we look at the Murabaha Agreement. And the promised purchase. I just want to draw some points of background to your attention in the first judgment. I'm sure you're very familiar with it, Your Honour, but if I could just go to tab A, which is the first judgment. It's page 274. We start at paragraph 50. Start with the two people identified by Dayar as acting in conflict with their interests in Dayar. The first, Mr. Nasser Al Sheikh, played a substantial role in events reflecting the fact that he was chairman of Dayar, chairman of Tarim, and vice chairman of NBC, as well as chairman of AMLA. The other was Mr. Bouti Al Jumay, director of both Tarim and Dayar, as well as chief financial officer of NBC. So, the first point I just wish to make is that there was a close relationship between all of these three parties. And this is to focus on the commercial judgment point and the relevance of both the commercial judgment point made by the judge and secondly also the, the question of the importance of Sharia law. And, and at the time, NBC was a substantial shareholder in Talib. So these were not necessarily arm's length transactions. Then picking it up at paragraph 19, the immediate background was that Talib, of which NBC and Amna Finance were shareholders, having been involved in the setting up and running of schools in the Middle East, had accumulated substantial losses and wished to identify and realise profitable short-term investments to improve its balance sheet. Starting point is a memorandum of understanding dated 1st May 2008 between Amlat Finance and First Dubai. Amlat Finance entered into a commitment to purchase 80% of the Sky Gardens project for AED 1.6, a billion payable instalments up to 15 May 2009. Mr. Al Sheikh, Presumably in his capacity as chairman of Amlat Finance, sent an email the next day to Mr. Al-Hami of Amlat Finance and Mr. Nizami of NBC, 
says he's closed the deal. So that's the 15th of May 2009. 21st, 21, in the wake of the MOU and Mr. Al Sheikh's proposal, both NBC and Tlaib were brought into the deal alongside Amlak Finance in equal shares. Background to and justification for the arrangement, so far as Tlaib was concerned, was at one stage a matter of some controversy. It proved to have no direct bearing on the later participation of DR. The moment it is only necessary to recall that on the 6th of May and 29th of May 2008, NBC paid its own and Tlaib shares at the down payment of 10%. It's also some note that at this stage, Landmark Properties, a real estate broker, was advising that the property should attract a substantial premium. In paragraph 23, on 16th of June 2006, DIFC replaced NBC as a party to the Sky Gardens transaction. This was prompted by what was regarded as an excessive real estate exposure on the part of NBC. This left, however, the earlier payments made by NBC on its own behalf. Furthermore, as already noted, it was also made payments on behalf of Tallinn. Further payments by NBC in support of post dated checks by, issued by Tallinn were scheduled. 7th of July, signed 15th of July 2008, Amlak Finance, DIFCI, and Tallinn entered into a tripartite agreement under which it was agreed that the beneficial owners of Sky Gardens should be vested in the three parties in shares of 34%, 33%, and 33%, respectively, with each party agreeing to be responsible for payment of a corresponding proportion of the purchase price. According to the agreed schedule, NBC agreed to pay the 33% share, it's AED 81 million of the third instalment due on the 15th of July on behalf of Tallinn. Further instalments were due on the 15th September and 15th November 2008, on 15th January, 15th March and 15th May 2009. Preparations were now in hand to ensure that the financing of Tallinn's interest in Sky Gardens could be structured in a Sharia compliant manner. Moreover, our agreement between NBC and Tallinn was to be structured as follows. Madaros, and that's an earlier name for NBC, uh, for Tallinn, I beg your pardon, to provide NBC with a promise to purchase. NBC to purchase the property on a cash basis from Amla. NBC to sell the property to Madaros at a higher price on a deferred basis. And then moving on, 30, paragraph 30, in September 2008, Already past the August 2008 deadline, Dayar came into the picture. <coughs> Initially, Dayar indicated an interest in converting the first three atriums of the Sky Gardens building into hotel apartments, including pre sold units elsewhere. Various options were canvassed, including outright sale or provision of rents and service apartments. 31, the transaction had been initially discussed by the CEOs of Talim and Dayar in late August. The outcome was a proposal on the 17th September that they are with Vitalin's interest in Sky Gardens. Detailed basis of this transaction being discussed between Mr. Azam and Mr. Kapoor of Talim and Mr. Nasser Al Sheikh. Calculated that Talim should make an overall profit in the long term in the region of AUD 150 million. Given the opportunity to make a quick sale, Talim agreed to accept a premium of AUD 65 to 70 million. And you can see what was said. <laughs> and then there is a, an email of 32, and then if we could go over the page to paragraph 33. On the 21st of October 2008, Talim signed the Murabaha Agreement, but it was backdated to the 6th of July 2008. Its function was to record that as of the 6th of July 2008, NBC had placed its 30.3% share of the disposal of Talim. As regards the proposed new day deal, Talim has noted that Barb was anxious to book the profit in its accounts for the year ending to 31st August 2008. This had been expressed as an imperative by Mr. Nasser Al Sheikh. And then also, this major impediment was the lack of documentation. This needed to be assembled by the 31st of October 2008. So, that is the background to the Murabaha Agreement as set out by the judge in the judgment. Please carry on, Mr. Nietzsche. I think we'll be looking at taking a break at uh, 10.45. 
Um, if we could then put it, that's simply by way of background to the Murabaha Agreement, and you'll find the Murabaha Agreement itself in bundle D1. See who the parties are on page 1259, the National Bonds in Tallinn, and you see the recitals. Whereas the buyer had requested the seller to purchase the property as more particularly described in Action 1, and promised to buy them from the seller after the seller had obtained title to the possession of the property. Whereas, pursuant to the buyer's promise to purchase, the seller has purchased the property and acquired title to the possession of the property. Consideration of the sale price defined in clause 3 1 below, in accordance with the terms and conditions of the promise in this agreement, the seller hereby sells by way of Murabah to the buyer, and the buyer purchases the property as more particularly described in Annexure 1. In 3.1, the sale price of the property by way of Murabah under this agreement is AED 136 million won, and then you can show the cost price, actual expenses, and profit. <coughs> the total sale price of 136,800,000 odd. The seller hereby confirms that the sale price, including its components, actual expenses and supporting invoices are correct. The buyer hereby acknowledges the adequacy and sufficiency of the sale price and unconditionally accepts the seller's right to receive the sale price in accordance with the terms and conditions of the promise and this agreement. The sale price shall be paid by to the by the buyer to the seller in accordance with clause 4.1 and then clause 4 point, clause 4 4.1 the buyer shall pay the sale price in accordance with an extra 2 of this agreement on the due date however it fails to pay on the due date it shall be obliged to pay such amount on the next instalment date including the amount to be payable on that instalment it fails to pay two consecutive instalments on their due dates for any reason all the remaining amounts and instalments shall become due and upon receiving a written notice from the seller. The buyer shall be liable to pay all the remaining outstanding amounts and instalments in one bullet payment within the period mentioned in the said notice. 4.2. In addition to the buyer's liability under clause 4.1, the buyer shall also be liable to compensate the seller for the actual loss caused to the seller due to the buyer's failure to pay and the payment schedule, unless otherwise determined by the competent court or arbitration court or arbitration was reasonably determined by the sellers, parties agree that the amount of the late payment charges shall be 2% of the total amount payable by the buyer hereunder of being paid on the due date. The seller shall be entitled to receive the late payment charges from the buyer and shall, after deducting its actual loss, donate on behalf of, donate, I beg your pardon, on behalf of the buyer the same to charities under the supervision of the seller's Sharia board. And then moving forward, so there was never an extra an extra two. There was never an extra two. Well, I'll just show you an extra two in a moment. So if you move on to clause 13. <laughs> this agreement is governed by the laws of Dubai, UAE, to the extent that these laws are not inconsistent with the principles of Sharia which case the principles of Sharia will prevail. Then 14.1, each of the parties irrevocably agrees to the benefit of the seller. The courts of Dubai and UAE shall have jurisdiction to hear and determine any suit action or proceedings and to settle any disputes which may arise out of or in connection with this agreement for such purposes. Irrevocably submits the jurisdiction of such courts. And your Lord your Honour will appreciate that the Court of Appeal held, and that was the first battle between these parties before my time, that the jurisdiction was obviously the jurisdiction of this court. So there was the jurisdiction clause was intended to refer to this court. And then over the page on page 65. Uh, 
that no amendment to the terms and conditions of this agreement is valid unless with the written mutual consent of the parties. And then 18, assignment. So I have lost the... Uh, uh, 17. 17. And then I just want to refer you to clause 18. Buyer shall not be entitled to assign or transfer all or any of its rights, benefits and obligations here under. Seller may subject to seller's Sharia board approval at any time assigned all or any of its rights and benefits here under, provided that no such assignment may be made without the prior notification to the buyer. So that is the Murabah Hara agreement, and you'll see that it provides a sale price which is inclusive of a profit figure, and it also provides for the consequences of late payment, namely, and it was common ground between the parties that that was 2% parties second hearing, that that was 2% of the overall price. And the reason why it's in that form is to, in order to comply with the Sharia standards, as is reflected in clause 13. But before you leave that, um, you were explaining to us 4.2, um, where the late charges of 2% uh, are fixed. <coughs> but uh, isn't the question of lateness determined by an extra 2? So if there's no an extra 2, when do the late, uh, when do the late charges kick in? Well, that was one of the difficulties. In, in, that is one of the difficulties in relation to the um, to this agreement is that they, the parties, Talim and NBC, had never agreed on it. And, and I'll show you the evidence. It just simply said it was an oversight. The way the judge dealt with that in his judgment to say, well, is, and I'll just show you that paragraph, if I may, in paragraph. Mm -hmm. Tab 11. <coughs> Is it tab 11 that you're referring to? Bundle B at tab 11. Sorry, it's a, I just want to show you how the judge dealt with the late payment charges. Paragraph 23. So, in fact, no in extra two was appended to the agreement, but it's scarcely an issue that the day I failed to pay the installments within a reasonable time. Late payment charges accordingly become due. But in the result, it was agreed that NBC's claim for a charge of 2%. At 2% per annum is not justified. Claim is restricted to 2% of the amount of payable. So we had prepared to accept, given the level of the claim, that it must have fallen due by the time of the second hearing, and it's a fixed amount. But no acceleration of 2% was not on the accelerated balance, but only on this, this, the instalment that should have been paid. Only on the instalment that should have been paid. It's on the original figure of 136 plus the profit figure, and then the repayment, you get 2%. So one of the difficulties about the Murabha agreement is, well, how long did you have time to pay? And well, that's not only that, I mean, if you're a day late, you pay that whole 2%? Well, if you're a day late, it first of all, it accelerates the, the balance, and then you, you then have to pay the 2%. But it is limited to the 2% on the, um, on the overall figure. And it is only, also if you're late on one installment, then there's no bullet uh, repayment yet. But there might be a late charge. But 
we'll leave it to the other council experts to explain. My point really is that the agreement itself provided both for the cost of finance, namely a profit figure, but structured as a sale, a sale of an interest with a profit figure, plus if you're late, a late payment charge. Internally, the agreement spells out what is to happen, what you have to pay, when you have to pay it, and what the consequences of non payment are. And the reason why, and I'll just show you the, I'll do this, no doubt will evoke the wrath of Mr. Kennel. Uh, but one, just see the Sharia standards that are referred to if one goes to Bundle G1. These are the specific standards that are referred to in clause 13. First tab, you're on. Right. Now the first uh, ten or so pages are not numbered. There is a, if you turn the page, there's a seven, and then a nine, and then a ten. There's then the introduction, and then one should reach, I hope, within four or five pages, Sharia standards number eight, Murabah had to the purchase order. About ten or so pages in. Sorry, I can't be more specific. Than that. Is there a heading? Uh, it's a, it's a, a page which just says Sharia standards number eight. Then the pages are numbered after that, so you have page 113 is the contents page, and then page 1144 is the um, preface, and it says the purpose of this standard is to explain the Sharia basis of rules for a Murahabadat to purchase order a transaction. The stages of this transaction beginning from the promise to transferring ownership of the goods to the customer, and the Sharia requirements that need to be observed by Islamic financial institutions. And then if one goes forward, please, to page 122. both the price of the item and the institution's profit on them, rather than to the purchase order of a transaction, be fixed and known to both parties on the signature of the contract itself, contract itself, not permitted under any circumstances to subject the determination of the price or the profit to unknown variations or variations that are determinable in the future, such as by concluding the sale or making the profit dependent on the rate of LIBOR that will prevail in the future. No objection to referring to any other known indicators during the promise stage as a comfort indicator to determine the rate of profit, providing that the determination of the institution's profit at the time of concluding the Murabaha to the purchase order is based on a certain percentage of the cost and is not tied up with LIBOR or a time factor. <coughs> Four seven, the institution's profit markup in Murabaha to the purchase order must be known and the mere mention of the total selling price is not sufficient. It's permissible that the profit be determined based on a lump sum amount or a certain percentage of the cost price only, or of the cost price plus the expenses. This determination is completed by the agreement and the mutual consent of the two parties. So you'll see from 4.6 that it's possible to give indicators during the promise stage as a comfort indicator to determine the rate of profit 
provided that the determination of the institution's profit at the time of concluding to the predator is based on a certain percentage and is not tied up with LIBOR or a time frame. And then if one put that away, and if I could ask you to go back to bundle D1 again, I just want to take you now to the prop promise to purchase, which you'll find in tab three. Which is the key document that my learned friend relied on in his submissions to the judge. And then if one goes to the seat of the recitals, it's heavily a promise to purchase. Promiser or hereby irrevocably and unconditionally undertakes to purchase the property from the beneficiary after the beneficiary has acquired title to and possession of the property. Promise or hereby undertakes that immediately upon receipt of the notice, through any recognised means, so as to be useful for subsequent reference and evidence from the beneficiary of the readiness of the property, the promisor shall forthwith purchase the property by signing the Murabaha contract and take delivery of the property upon the terms and conditions of this promise and the Murabaha contract to be executed, executed. Sale of the property in accordance with the terms of this promise shall be on the Murabaha basis that the sale price calculated as follows. Amount of total cost plus beneficiaries promised profit calculated at 5.5% per annum on the amount specified in 2.1 above. <coughs> and as you will know that that's the figure uh, that is, makes up the 1.49. And then are there any other? So we just pause there a minute and try to look back again. So it's that so five. Can you reconcile 4.2 um, of the Murabaha uh, <coughs> agreement and the close to point two of the promise to purchase, don't you get two conflicting uh, finance charges? Well, the, the answer is that if you look at clause, if you keep your finger in page 1265 and go back to page 1259, 59, 1259, 